well, thank you, everyone, for, for coming out tonight. Uh, for years ago, I, you know, I was asked, like, what's your title? What is it that you do? And I, you know, I, I work for myself. I have my own business. I've been doing this for 10 years. So I created a title for myself, a theatrical performance activist. <laughs> And that sort of encompasses a lot of what I do. And um, with that is scholarship, bringing in other people's scholarship and my own scholarship. Uh, and, um, and so I get to go to lots of different places and do one-person shows on a variety of social justice topics, often overlaying various topics together. Uh, and I do a lot with the Bible. In fact, these days I'm kind of seen more and more as a Bible person. You bring Peterson in to do Bible scholarship, alternative readings. But I have a confession to make, if I may. That if I'm honest, the biblical studies that I do, the Bible scholarship I do, is actually a byproduct of my art and my activism. I don't actually go out of my way to do Bible scholarship. It just has come about because of the work that I do. And I think in part because the Bible has been used as such a weapon against queer people and our bodies and our lives. And the Bible was used basically to beat the snot out of me. And when I say snot, I mean shit. <laughs> And so it has been critical for me to engage in a creative dialogue with these very texts that oppressed me. And in so doing, I've been able to do it in a public forum, and other people have been able to enjoy it and, and benefit from it. So that's one confession. I have another confession I'm going to make in a moment. But, um, but Sharon was talking about, like, I'm the go-to person, bring me in for anything. And it seems like that has definitely happened. And I was thinking about the type of venues that people bring me to, that I think sometimes the venues have no idea that the other venue brought me in. I mean, there was one day I was at a conservative Quaker church doing the Sunday school for the youth one morning. And that evening, I was at a drag club doing my play Queer 101, Now I Know My Gay BCs. <laughs> and so I compiled just a short list of, in the past 10 years, the sort of venues that I've been in. And this is the wonderful thing. If you choose a career as a performance artist, there will be months that you will not eat much. <laughs> but you will get to go to some pretty awesome, exotic, wonderful places and meet the most amazing people. So in the, you know, I do a lot of work at universities, colleges. So I've been to you know, some are include Swarthmore College, Drew University, University of Puget Sound, uh, the Pacific School of Religion, Chicago Theological Seminary, University of Barcelona, Cambridge University, and even Eastern Mennonite University. <laughs> in Harrisonburg, Virginia, where I was the first openly gay person to be paid by the school to present <laughs> queer biblical content on campus. What year was that? I'm sorry. I'm just curious. 2009. Um, I do work with, um, with high school and middle school students and been lots of high schools, including Sidwell School and um, Friends School in D.C., where the Obama girls go. Uh, Boston Public Schools, and I've been three times to a middle school in Northern Ireland, in Newcastle, um, where even my Irish friends look at me and say, you did what? <laughs> you talked about queer issues in one of our schools? It's, that doesn't seem possible. I've been to virtually every denomination, either in their church or their conference, uh, and other spiritual spaces, and even smaller denominations, so radical fairies, Mormons, Seventh-day Adventists, and private meetings with evangelical pastors in central Kansas and in the Scottish Highlands. <laughs> uh, I've performed at a Sufi worship center recently in Albuquerque at the Slifka Center for Jewish Life at Yale, um, and interestingly enough at the British Humanist Society in London where I did an evening of Bible at the Humanist Society <laughs> with LGBT atheists, uh, which was loads of fun. <laughs> I'm a trained actor, so I perform actually in professional theater spaces as well. I've done lots of theaters, including the National Theater of Malta, 
twice I've been to the little <laughs> island country of Malta. But interesting, when, just so you know, when you're asked to speak or perform in Malta, you have to submit your script months in advance to the blasphemy board, <laughs> which is made up of a team of Catholic priests <laughs> who will either affirm or deny your entry and then give it a rating. Mine always got like an NC-17. Uh, with my play that I recently did there, Jesus Had Two Daddies, I totally had to take this whole section out about Jesus' birth and Mary's vagina. It was like, it's just not going to fly. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, you know, perform in lots of LGBT spaces, including like the LGBTQ Center uh, in, in Chicago, in Stockholm, in Tacoma, and at a gay bar in Cape Town, South Africa a couple years ago. Been to lots of academic conferences where, you know, you present a paper. And so I just kind of thought, well, a play is kind of like a paper, right? <laughs> And, it, and I have to say, if you're ever at an academic conference and you can perform, do it. Because after like the 10th paper, whatever you do, it's going to look like a Broadway show. <laughs> oh, no, seriously. It's amazing. And so I've been to McGill University at conferences, uh, uh, American University, University of Puerto Rico, and the University of Cameroon, where it was illegal for me to perform my play. And it was very courageous of the conference organizers to have me go there and do it. I've been to the Creating Change Conference. I presented at the Lambeth Conference in 2008, somehow as a personal guest of the Archbishop of Wales, who I never slept with. I really have <laughs> no idea how that happened. <laughs> no, it's actually through some really good queer activism that that happened. And recently, I presented a joint presentation of, of the SBL AAR Conference, which I affectionately call SPLAR. <laughs> Uh, and I presented my work, particularly my Transfigurations work, at lots of trans spaces, uh, trans conferences, like Gender Odyssey, which takes place in Seattle, which is a predominantly trans male space. Uh, I've been to the Trans Faith Conference in Charlotte, which is a lot of trans people of color. And maybe one of the most moving was when I was invited to lead a retreat for a group called the Sibyls in England. We met in a country manor house that rivaled Downton Abbey. <laughs> and, and the Sibyls were basically elderly trans women. Uh, they, they identified as transsexual women who, were, ha at least half of them, were clergy that were kicked out of church because they were trans. Uh, and it was very moving to be with these older women who had seen a lot of life, and I was able to bring them good news about gender nonconforming Bible stories that most of them had never even heard of or considered before. So I feel very like honored to go to places to learn so much and to share the things that I learn. And I thought I'd start with a piece from Doing Time in the Homo Nomo Halfway House, which is one of my funniest plays, but I'm going to do a, a little bit more of a serious part. Uh, in the play, I take on one biblical passage, and it's the story of Lazarus, and when Jesus brings Lazarus from the dead. And I have my, a character tell that story, and then I end the play where I am myself, finally, after playing eight different characters, and I read a poem that I wrote about the story, but particularly about the disciples, who Jesus gave the instruction, take off the grave clothes and let him go. And I think of the many people in this room who are doing justice work, who are grappling with issues, queer theology, queer theory, counseling, pastoral care. Uh, and I think this might speak to you. The title of the poem is Grave Robbers. Lazarus came forth gleaming white, a pillar wrapped tight outside his tomb. Jesus looked at us. Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Panic twisted my gut like a wet wash rag wringing out courage. Who knows how to unwrap a mummy raised from the dead? Does one start at the heart or close to the head? We circled him as if he were a bomb to diffuse. Then we began in earnest, unbinding, tearing, speaking comfort as we went. The crowd pressed in, hurling advice like stones. Lazarus stood like marble, 
cold from his grave, while we sweated in the cruel sun, unwrapping his trappings. But suddenly, or did it take years, it was complete. Mary and Martha washed their brother in tears. He was free, naked and in his right mind. You can clap if you like. I mean, I'm a, <laughs> performers like that. You don't have to. Um, but performers do like that sort of action. Um, I have a second confession to make. Uh, these are the only two confessions of the night. Uh, the second confession is, although I go to lots of different audiences, and I will go to virtually any audience, I am absolutely mercenary. I want to present as often uh, as to as many people as possible. I love it, and I, you know, I really do. But if I could choose one group to always go to, I would have to say that ultimately I see myself as a missionary to the evangelicals. <laughs> No question about that. I have good news for evangelicals that they really want to hear. And, and there's a lot of talk these days about bridge building between, you know, queer folks and the church or church queer folks and the church who kicked them out. You know, and there's talk about reconciliation work. I'm not interested in that work. I'm interested in liberation work. Literally going and setting the captives free in these churches or who are held hostage by text that keep them from loving their neighbor. And I've got good news for them and that really is a lot of what I do. But I'm happy to do what I do in front of lots of people. <laughs> so I thought um, in, in my own personal life uh, with theology and all, after almost 20 years of being in ex-gay programs, I needed to address some Bible passages, the clobber passages, the text of terror. And books about this have been written multiple times. I think uh, Mark Jordan re referenced this the other night. You know, we seem to write some of the same books over and over again. And I have to say that as someone who was a born-again evangelical conservative Republican Christian for many years, when I first came out, I found no convincing arguments on the clobber passages, not because people weren't good enough, but m my ears couldn't hear it, and s I had to take matters into my own hands. I don't like doing a lot of defensive theology. It's negative, it's sort of, you know, a lot of work having to defend yourself and your humanity, but sometimes it's important. But if I can, I like to do that work and not just be defensive, but to go further to take a text and expand it further and raise some questions. So I'm going to do a scene from my play, um, The Re-Education of George W. Bush, No President Left Behind. <laughs> it's a play I wrote in 2007 and performed a lot in 2008. It actually is not to be make fun of George W. Bush, but it's actually to help us see that if you grew up in the United States, many of us have a little George W. Bush living inside of us, our own little Bush, that needs... <laughs> to be re-educated. <laughs> this crowd, I love it. Uh, and so there's a series of lessons, and the way the play set up, um, George Bush and Condoleezza Rice and the whole cabinet are embedded in disguise in the audience. And so um, they decided to come to the play that night for whatever reason. And so I pitch all of the stories to George Bush and company. So um, I do a series of lessons, and the first one is a Bible lesson, and it's taught by one of my favorite characters, the Reverend Dr. Meadows. Good evening and welcome. I am the Reverend Dr. Meadows, and I have the distinct pleasure of presenting a brief Bible lesson. And fear not, I have selected a passage that is rife with sex and violence. <laughs> Actually, much of the Bible is. I want to tell you about the story of Sodom. Mm, yes, I know, President Bush, wherever you are lurking, you're thinking, ah, a story that highlights the immorality and the danger of homosexuality. Well, actually, no. I mean, if you really just look closely at the text, it doesn't take much to see that this story is not about sexuality. It's definitely not about the gays. It's about other things. Mm. Um, so, um, in the story, it actually begins outside of the city of Sodom at the tents of Abraham, Abram, the, the patriarch known to be the most righteous man in the world, particularly by Abram himself. 
sitting, minding his own business, when he sees in the distance three strangers coming across the desert, he immediately gets up, goes over to them, and bows down low before them, thus initiating the ancient guest-host relationship, the ancient code of conduct by which people were judged righteous or not by how they treated guests and strangers in their midst. Abram brought them back to his home, washed their feet, prepared food, set it before them. Well, not Abraham himself. He actually had a staff to help with all that. <laughs> but they sat, and it turns out one of the visitors was actually God in human drag form. <laughs> and God let drop the next thing on the to-do list. God heard that Sodom was an incredibly wicked city and decided that God was going to utterly destroy the city. But first, send some servants just to check it out. This disturbed Abraham, not simply because he was so very righteous, but also because he had some vested interest <laughs> in Sodom, namely his nephew Lot and Lot's wife and two daughters, who in the story do not have names. It often happens with women in the Bible. So. Abraham does something rather bold, rather courageous, actually questions God if this is the correct course of, a of action to take. So, um, hang on, God. Um, there are lots of people who live in Sodom, good, bad, in between. I mean, surely you would spare the city if you, you could find, I don't know, 45 or, or 50 righteous people. Well, God hemmed and hawed a bit and relented and said, all right, if I can find 50 righteous people, I will spare the city. Well, Abraham, seeing that the door was open a crack, leapt right in and said, what about 45? Do you have 45, 40, 35, 20, 15, 10? And so said, God said, all right, 10. If I can find 10 good, righteous people, I will spare this city, but none less. For you see, God was in a smiting mood. God went off to do whatever God had to do and sent the two servants to Sodom. We can think of them today as ancient UN inspectors seeking out wickedness worthy of mass destruction. <laughs> and as they approach the city, who's sitting there at the gates but none other than Abraham's nephew Lot? These ancient biblical men did lots of sitting and waiting <laughs> for things to happen. Noting that these were strangers in its midst, Lot gets up, bows down low before them, thus initiating the ancient guest host relationship, brings them back to their home, washes their feet, prepares food and sets it before them. Well, again, not Lot himself. He had a <laughs> wife and two teenage daughters to do that for him. You know, it's, it's always easier to extend hospitality to when you have others to do the heavy lifting <laughs> for you. Yes. So they're sitting, they're having a lovely evening when all of a sudden, <laughs> there's a pounding at the front door and all of the men in the city of Sodom, young and old, gathered outside and demanded that Lot sends out these two male visitors so that they could have sex with them. Mm, yes, President Bush, I know what you're thinking, that I said that this story had nothing to do with homosexuality, but it appears we are about to witness some man-on-man -man action. <laughs> Well, it's not exactly like the, the, the town's men gathered and said, well, bring out the guest and we'll, we'll have a drink or a meal, do a little dancing. One thing might lead to another. <laughs> no, what they had in mind was public humiliation, gang rape. What they had in mind has nothing to do with what happens in the happy homes of lesbian and gay couples and much more to do with what happened at, say, Abu Ghraib prison. This disturbed Lot, and courageously he stepped outside, gingerly closing the door behind him to address his neighbors. Friends, please do not do this wicked thing. Whew, thank goodness. Someone who can tell the difference between right and wrong, you would think. Until you hear Lot's next modest proposal. <laughs> Hang on, inside, I've got two daughters, virgins, Never been touched. How about I send them out? You could do whatever you like with them, but please, whatever you do, don't do anything to these men. Strange how protection and privilege extends to one gender over another. Yeah, and it didn't work. The, the crowd was not satisfied with this. Um, I guess the attitude perhaps was, well, your daughters we always have with us. These men are here for a limited time only while supplies last. <laughs> so they pressed in against Lot and the two angels well, the two men pulled him inside, shut the door, and lucky for Lot, they turned out to be angels in disguise, replete 
with superpowers, <laughs> including the ability to cast blindness on the mob, thus creating a momentary diversion so that Lot and the family could escape. The angels addressed them, God is going to utterly destroy this wicked city. Run for your lives. Oh, yes, and as you go, um, you, you don't look back. Just, just keep going. Go! <laughs> so Lot, his wife, his two daughters, still have no names, gathered a few things, go out the back door, escape the city, and run for their lives. Now Lot's wife, I don't know, but ha perhaps she's not particularly good at following directions. <laughs> or maybe she's just one of the contrary sorts. <laughs> or maybe she realized she left something precious behind. The other women, the children, who are not counted in this census of good and evil people. Whatever reason it was, she could not turn her back on that violence. And she turned and witnessed that firepower falling on that desert city. And whether it was God's punishment against her, or perhaps she was overwhelmed with grief. But at that moment, it says in the text, she turned into a pillar of salt. Lot and his two daughters continued their escape, go up into the hills and safely land in a cave. Mm, yes, and if you should continue to read the narrative in Genesis of Lot and his daughters, you will learn that at some point Lot gets drunk, has sex with both of his daughters, and they somehow get blamed for it. Yes, you see, I don't think we really want to get our ideas of sex education and family values from this particular story. Because it's not about that at all, not about sexuality, not about gays and lesbians. I guess you, one could possibly stretch it and say, this is a story about hospitality. <laughs> <laughs> See, I think we have the idea of sodomy all wrong. When we have someone in our care, within our borders, on our streets, in our prisons, in our schools, in our very homes, we sodomize them when we treat them like shit. The word. Of the Lord. <laughs> I easily grew tired, though, of defensive theology. Um, you know, in part because of, the, of all the clobber passages, the Sodom one is the only one that's a story. The rest are all like laws and teachings and side notes and. You know, it's just so boring after a while. You know, like this Greek word really doesn't mean that, and Paula wasn't talking about that, and they were worshiping Diana in chicken suits. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's just exhausting, and it's unconvincing. And so move on, is what I say. So, so I said, well, is there other sort of work that we can do? And it really didn't come out of me even wanting to do more theology. I was very moved by people I was meeting on my journeys, and particularly trans folks who were, I was meeting. And I was under this weird impression when I came out gay that I had landed in some sort of wonderful, inclusive, rainbow collective. But I quickly discovered that people were treated differently based on what they looked like, what they had, what they didn't have what their sexuality was, that if you were bisexual, you were, were suspect or, or totally discouraged from being part of the collective. And based on, you know, treated differently based on your gender, your gender identity, your gender presentation. I was like, this is what I came out of bondage for, for this? And I became moved. And so I started some research. And the first part of it was ethnographic, where I just did interviews with a whole variety of trans folks in the United States, in uh, the UK, in Sweden, and in South Africa, and a variety of trans folks. So some who identified as transsexual and who transitioned from male to female or female to male um, with hormones and surgery, others who identified as trans and didn't have surgery or hormones or part or you know, a whole combination. And then people who identified as genderqueer, as neither male nor female, some who identified as femme, butch, a whole variety. And it was a wonderful education. All I did was sat down and say, tell me your story. And I just soaked in stories. And I heard similarities often, story to story, and many differences. Moments of courage, of, of terror, of humor. 
And I just collected these stories for over a year and a half. And then I went to the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, the Christian Bible, texts that people assume have very clear guidelines about gender, about how men and women are supposed to act, and roles that men and women have. And so if it's so clear, then it wouldn't be that difficult to see when someone is misbehaving. So I went to the text and I put on my gender lenses, which looks something like this. <laughs> And I ask the critical question, who in these texts, who is transgressing and transcending gender? Who breaks the rules of gender? Who rises above them? And I discovered that some of the most important people and the most important Bible stories are gender nonconforming. And I'll do some sections now from my play, Transfigurations, Transgressing Gender in the Bible. I do this performance in a multiple ways. You're looking at a performance lecture version of it because that's where we are. Um, but I have a full play version, a full um, um, you know, performance on stage with makeup, uh, that when I'm in a theater space with lights, that's what I do. It has a very dramatic ending even. Um, and I have sort of an activist version too where I do the lecture performance, but then local trans people from the community, um, are, their stories are woven in to the play, and so they come forward and they tell their stories at different parts of the play. Uh, and so different ways. And similarly, I change my language and the presentation style based on my audience. I'm going to talk to one group very differently from another. If it's in a pure academic setting, it will be much more academic. If it's an evangelical setting, that's great, because I speak evangelical as a second language. <laughs> so it works really well. So tonight, you're getting a kind of a hybrid of a hybrid. Uh, and I want to do, the first thing I want to look at is the story of Deborah in the book of Judges. Deborah is an interesting character. She stands out in a book that there are all these male leaders and suddenly there's this female leader that emerges. Not that women can't be military, political, spiritual leaders. It's just that it didn't happen much in the text. You have Miriam. Um, people talk about Judith who isn't really included in, in, in the, you know, the acceptable text by the people who accepted them. Um, but, um, but really, and even today, it's, it's kind of rare to see you know, women in places of power. It's, it's notable. And so we have in Deborah someone who is a poet, a prophet, a judge, and a warrior. Not your typical Jewish mother. <laughs> so I want to do this scene from Transfigurations. I am Deborah. They say I seem different from the girls growing up, but I remained ignorant to the ways of boys and men until, of course, I married one, Lepidoth, my husband. Then I set about to discover the difference between these men and me. I quickly determined I am as smart as they, wiser than many, stronger than most. I looked further into the matter to uncover this difference between these men and me, and I discovered one thing. Yes, these men have one thing that I do not. One little thing. <laughs> I reason, surely I have resources. I can fashion for myself my own little thing. <laughs> But being greedy, I thought, why stop there? Why not have one big thing? <laughs> and I love how it feels, long and hard, pressing up against my thigh, this sword, which of course is the next best thing. And with this sword, I have become Deborah. They come here to the palm of Deborah, and I judge matters between them small and great. But I also listen. I listen to the rumblings of our enemy, for there are many on all sides that trouble us. You see, I serve as father and mother 
over the people. After a season of listening, I called to my side my general, Barak. General, our enemy, Sisera, raises up an army against us. You are to raise up your own army of 20,000 men. Enter the battle, fear not. You will have victory. My general, courageous and wise, said, Nay, Deborah, we will not fight unless you agree to fight alongside with us. Agreed, general. I will join you and your men. You will have victory, but know that since you ask this of me, the glory will go to a woman. We prepared for battle. I put on my breastplate, took up my shield, my sword, my helmet. I entered the battleground looking like all the other warriors. I fought amongst the most valiant, and we routed our enemies. They fled before us like frightened sheep. And then I saw him in the distance, coward. Sisera, our enemy, as he leapt from his chariot and fled into the forest, escaping our grasp. And this, Sisera, ran and ran until he came to the tent of Yael. Yael, that beautiful hostess. Her honey cakes are the finest in all the land. Yael, a woman on the borderlands of mixed allegiances. Yael, my friend. She welcomed our enemy into her tent, gave him food to eat, milk to drink, a place to lie down. He begged her for a blanket under which he concealed himself, and there he fell into a dead sleep. Yael, that beautiful hostess, Graceful as a willow, mighty as a cedar of Lebanon, she, too, like me, had her own little thing, a sharpened tent peg. And with that sharpened tent peg, she quietly stole up next to our sleeping enemy, not forgetting all the ways he had troubled our women. And she silently knelt beside him, placing the point of the peg at his temple, and bashed it through his skull, so that when my general and his troops came by, she beckoned them into her tent, and there he saw our enemy slain. My general came to me and reported all. Yes, general, it is exactly as I had prophesied, and did I not also tell you that the glory would go to a woman, this woman, Yael? No, you thought that I spoke of myself. I left off being a woman long ago, ever since I became myself. I am Deborah. So what's so interesting to me about the Deborah story in Judges is there are three women in the story. There's Deborah, Yael, and Sisera's mother. Uh, who comes up afterwards, and it's very poignant and, uh, and tender in a way. She's waiting for her son to come back, not realizing that he was slain. Uh, and, and, and these three women there. But what's interesting is, particularly with Yael and Deborah, they're both presented as female, but they're gendered differently. Uh, and, and it's not just a matter of imposing our modern views of gender on them, but in the text, they are very much gendered differently. I mean, you have... Yael, who's sort of like a Martha Stewart type character, and Deborah is like a Xena warrior princess kind of gal. Now, they're both warriors, all right? And they have their own way of doing warfare and leading, um, and, but they're gendered differently, and I like that it reveals this gender diversity. There are different ways of performing female, different ways of presenting as female. If I were to create one of those silly imaginary lines in front of the room where I said on the one side is extreme male, the other side extreme female, um, based on what you feel or what people impose upon you, put yourself somewhere on the line, chances are we would not have two clumps of people at either end of the room, a binary. But a spectrum or people hanging from the ceiling or whatever, I, this, this room would be fun, I think. Uh, and, and, and so I like that in this story we can highlight like this gender variance going on and this gender queer Deborah who is such a hybrid of gender going on there. It's one way of reading it. 
There's another story in the Hebrew Bible that does the same thing with two men. And what makes it really delicious is that they're two brothers who are twin brothers. I'm talking about Esau and Jacob. You all know this story? Okay, so pretend for a moment that you are a casting agent. And there's a new production going up, a new film, Esau and Jacob, and you are responsible for figuring out who to hire to play these parts. So in looking, but based on what you know of the text and how these guys are described physically and also uh, their personalities, when you're looking for an Esau, what, what are you looking for? What kind of person, what kind of type are you looking for with Esau? It's not a rhetorical question. Harry. Yeah. Like, okay, Harry. Like, we say Harry. Like, like from a one to ten, how Harry? Ten. Ten. All right, so not actually even a bear, <laughs> but a gorilla, okay? Like a gorilla man, okay? And, and personality-wise, activity-wise, what's, what's Esau all about? Hunter, he's an outdoorsman, hunting. Um, he's uh, darker than his brother. It was darker from birth, but probably darker all the time because he was always out in the field. Where, where was Jacob? He was tending the sheep, but also he dwelt amongst the tents. It was referenced him a lot, dwelling amongst the tents. And what activity, while his brother's out hunting, what activity we would see Jacob doing? Cooking. All right, which is no big deal, right? Men cook all the time. Except not in the Bible, interestingly <laughs> enough. <laughs> you know, you don't actually have any men cooking in the Bible. I mean, they'll sacrifice animals, burnt offerings, you know, like holy barbecue kind of stuff. But, but actually preparing a meal, like if you take like the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Bible, you're like, okay, you've got Jacob. And then you go, okay, uh, okay, you go to the Gospels, all right, all the Gospels. Then you have a post-resurrection Jesus doing a little fish fry on the side of the lake. <laughs> I mean, it's just not something that men do. And so, like, they're, it's interesting, they're just gendered differently. And then, of course, um, Jacob has a very famous son named Joseph, who is celebrated in lots of texts, in, in, in Islamic text, and, and the, the Jewish rabbis have written a lot about, about Joseph, this beautiful man this beautiful boy. And so I want to do a scene from Transfigurations where I tell the story of Joseph, but I change the perspective a little bit. It's important sometimes to put a story in somebody else's mouth to see what happens. Yeah, I'm Esau. You probably know my brother Jacob, although he went and changed his name to Israel. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, we're twins, Jacob and me, although you'd never know it by looking at us. I mean, I'm a real man. I'm big. I'm hairy. I'm always out doing real men's work. Well, my brother, well, he always was very sensitive growing up. <laughs> Smooth as a woman. He liked to dwell amongst the tents with their women, their cooking, their gossiping, their scheming. He was a real girly boy. <clears throat> and since I was normal, our father Isaac, well, he favored me. Now, the thing about my brother, although he was a girly boy, he liked the women, okay? In fact, he had two wives and slept with both their handmaidens. And from those women, he had a pack of children, daughters, sons, strong, strapping young men, all of them. Yeah, well, except for one of his youngest, Joseph. <laughs> Listen, this kid was trouble from the day he was born, always crying, clinging to his mother. And then when he got older, he wouldn't go out in the field to do real men's work. He dwelt amongst the tents. And then he would have these dreams these crazy dreams he told everyone about. Listen, boys are not supposed to dream. <laughs> One day I pulled my brother aside. I said, you got to do something to this kid. Toughen him up. It's a rough world. They're just going to ride right over him. But does he listen to me? No. Indulges him, gives him everything he wants, including that robe. Listen, you wouldn't catch me dead in a robe like that. <laughs> for one, too expensive for my taste. A royal garment, the kind of garment a king would bestow upon his virgin daughter. Yeah, it was a princess dress. <laughs> yeah, my brother Jacob gave his son Joseph a princess dress. <laughs> dress. And that kid put that dress on, flitted about the compound like he was some kind of butterfly. And I thought, this is not going to end well. 
sure enough, when the boys were out in the field doing real men's work, uh, Jacob sent Joseph to go check on them. And that kid, no sense in his head. He puts on the stupid dress, goes traipsing across the countryside, making fools of all of us. Well, his brother saw him from a distance. Who could miss him in that getup? And they said, enough of this dreamer. And they rushed him. They threw him to the ground. They beat him black and blue, trying to beat some sense into him. Then they ripped off the stupid dress, tore it to pieces, defiled it in blood. They came back with a bloody garment and a story about how their brother was attacked by a wild beast, and that was all that remained. But later they pulled me aside and told me what really happened, how they sold their brother as a slave to some traders going off to Egypt. And I thought, you know what? It's probably all for the best. I mean, listen, I'm a shepherd. I know you got a weak lamb, you take it out. It's just going to bring the rest of them down. And besides, I don't know, he might do okay for himself there in Egypt land where they go in for that whole girly boy thing. <laughs> well, years go by, I didn't give him a second thought. Who's got time to mourn? Then we had that famine, the drought. I've been through it many times. You just got to be man enough to ride it out, but not this time. It was like... The earth was cursed against us. You couldn't scratch life out of it. It got so bad, we finally sent the boys to Egypt to get some grain. Not to beg, mind you. We begged from no one. And they were brought before some high official in Pharaoh's court. And at first, they couldn't tell what it was. A man or a woman with a headdress, the makeup, the flowing robes. Shh, those Egyptians. <laughs> Turns out, it was their very own brother, Joseph. Somehow that girly boy worked his way up through the ranks to become second in command of the whole kingdom. But they didn't recognize him under all that gunk. Now this was Joseph's chance to get back at his brothers. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You don't let anyone ride over you. But does he? No. Not that girly boy. He goes off weeping like a woman. And then he comes back to try to teach his brothers a lesson. And then sooner or later, he forgives them and he reconciles them. He gives them food. He gives them shelter. He treats them like he's their sister or their mother or something, not like any man I've ever seen. And in so doing, that girly boy, my nephew, Joseph, he saved us all. Now, I don't know about you, I can't read the story of Joseph and his brothers without crying at some point. I'm tender that way. And even when I watch Joseph in the amazing Technicolor dream coat, <laughs> there's that moment, that big reveal moment. I'm like, oh, God, no. It's a very moving story. It's a beautifully told story. The narrative, the structure of the story is really lovely. And, you know, you've got this, you've got this blended family with lots of tension going on there and Joseph's the favored son and he's a bit of a brat too and so there's all these tension going on and there's questions about inheritance rights who's going to get the stuff and then to make matters worse Jacob at one point gives Joseph a garment now if you look at any Bible commentary or study Bible almost always there's a note at this point on, on the garment it says the exact Hebrew word, meaning of the Hebrew word is unclear the scholars don't know exactly what kind of garment that Jacob gave Joseph. Well, that's not so, you know, odd. I mean, Hebrew is an ancient language. and don't know everything about it. So you have to say, well, what is the word, and how else is it used in the text? Well, the word is a phrase. It's ketonet pasim. And if you look for it in the book of Genesis, it appears nowhere else. It just appears with the garment that Jacob gave Joseph that the brothers ultimately ripped off of him and defiled in blood. So then you have to say, okay, well, does it appear anywhere else in the text that might give us an understanding? And it doesn't. Nowhere in all of the Hebrew Bible, Ketonet Pasim appears nowhere except for one other passage in 2 Samuel. It's a story about King David. It's actually a story about King David's daughter, Tamar. It's a tragic story of sexual violence and rape and what happens to a family and a nation when people don't take that seriously. And in the story, Tamar is tricked and raped by her half-brother. And in the story, she rents her garment 
And like Joseph, she too is wearing a ketonet passim. And in the text, it actually defines it for us and says, the garment worn by the virgin daughters of the king. A princess dress. Now, I can just imagine a, a straight, gender normative, traditional male scholar looking at the Genesis account, looking at the Second Samuel account, and concluding the exact meaning of the Hebrew word is unclear. <laughs> no, no, we have no idea. No, it could mean anything. Now, I'm sorry, if you have any intellectual integrity, you have to admit that one possible interpretation is that Jacob gave his son a female garment. It doesn't have to be the interpretation you agree with. It doesn't have to be the definitive one, but it has to be on the table because it's in the text. And if you go with that interpretation for a moment, well, suddenly the story takes on a different light. When the brothers, who already have issues with Joseph, see him in public wearing the ketonet passim, they do violence against him and against his clothing. They tear it to pieces. Uh, it's this punitive violence, as a, like, we're going to teach you a lesson. And if it was such a fine-ass garment that they all were envious, they would have somehow figured a way to ditch their brother, and somebody would have gone home wearing the ketonet passim, but none of them wanted anything to do with it. And the violence I see in that story reminds me of violence I hear about today towards gender nonconforming people, particularly transgender people, especially transgender women of color. How many of you have ever attended the Transgender Day of Remembrance? Raise your hand. Thank you. Um, it's not the only day that we recognize trans people and their lives, um, but to me, it's the most sacred day of the queer calendar. It's the day we gather November 20th to say the names of all the trans people that we know of who were murdered uh, violently so often, as we heard about earlier today, um, because they were gender nonconforming and trans. And the list is always so long, and the violence is so shockingly extreme. If you've never been, please put it on your calendar. T you can take out your phone, if you like, right now, and put on your calendar, November 20th, Transgender Day of Remembrance. Please go, if you're not trans, your presence will be noted. It will mean a lot. It, you know, it's like going to a funeral. You go because you care. So Joseph experiences this extreme violence at the hands of his brothers and goes off to Egypt, where he is favored by everyone. Everybody loves Joseph. His boss, Potiphar, Potiphar's wife. And then even <laughs> in the all-male prison population, Joseph rises to the top and becomes second in command of the whole kingdom. And then the moment comes, the brothers come in the story. And this is really, he's got the power to crush them and the right. I mean, you, he could have easily just kind of got rid of the whole bunch but his youngest brother and just sort of like, let's just reboot the family. <laughs> and in a way, that's how that family would operate. I mean, it was so often action, reaction. You hit me, I hit you harder. Uh, but Joseph acts like no man up until that point. He changes what a man does and sort of expands it and becomes in a way like the matriarch of the family, bringing them all together. And so I see Joseph as a very gender nonconforming character. Now it's interesting, you put the gender lens on Joseph and he's a hero, you can put a different lens on him and he's a villain. I mean, if you were to put sort of like a, you know, an Occupy Wall Street lens on Joseph, the work that he does to basically get all of the wealth into Pharaoh's hand, well, you know, he creates the ultimate, you know, 1%. Uh, and that's, you know, that's, you know, and that's, I think it's interesting. You can look at a character in, in a Bible story and they have different shadows and shades. Does anybody need to stand up and stretch? How we doing? How you feeling? Does anyone have an absolutely burning question you must ask this moment that's not long and complicated? <laughs> Okay, we'll carry on then. So, to talk about gender nonconforming people in the Bible, obviously it's important to have a discussion about. Wait, was there a question? No, I was just saying they're all long and complicated. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I've been with you people for like a couple days now. I know how it works. <laughs> I need a thesaurus to answer one of your questions. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so. 
So it's important to have a conversation about Unix, because Unix appear in the Bible. Do we know what you, about Unix? Yeah, not the computer operating system. <laughs> right. That's Unix. I'm talking about Unix. Right, you know the difference? Uh, so in, in the ancient world, there were a group of people known as Unix. Uh, and Janet Everhart has done some brilliant research in her dissertation through that she did at ILIF uh, about Unix. What was that? What's going on there? Oh, <laughs> and uh, you know, and, and so you know, her scholarship informs my work, and it's one of the examples of how I do my own scholarship, but I also infuse my work with other scholars' work, uh, so that this artist, activist, scholar business can take place, where you do this fabulous, moving scholarship, and then I put it on <laughs> stage. So she's done some great work about Unix, and, and, and she gives this broad definition of a eunuch in the ancient world is a non-procreative male. Uh, and so often these are males who were castrated, sometimes in war as a punishment, um, but often as young people before puberty, young boys were castrated. Sometimes it was a partial castration where they would remove the testicles, and other times it was a complete castration with, with penis and testicles. Uh, but as a result, since it happened at such a young age, these boys never experienced male puberty. They never produced testosterone in their system. They retained high voices. They didn't get the facial hair or the body hair that came with testosterone, the, the, all the muscles that come, the prominent brow that forms over the years. They looked and sounded different from the people around them. All right? In the ancient world, there were men, women, and eunuchs. Often they didn't choose to be eunuchs. They didn't want to be a sexual minority. They didn't want to be gender variant. They didn't make that choice for themselves. But they functioned as such all the same. And they had a variety of roles in the ancient world. Some people think of them as just the people who take care of the, the women in the women's quarters. But if you look, uh, just in the book of Esther, there are 12 different eunuchs named in the book of Esther. In fact, I think you can call it the book of eunuchs. Because if you take the eunuchs out of the Esther narrative, the whole story falls apart before the beginning of chapter one. There would be no story. And this is where the, the Jewish celebration of Purim comes from, uh, and, and, and with Hadassah saving the people. Uh, and I think it's really important if you ever go to a Purim celebration, and encourage people to focus on the eunuchs as well as Esther and everyone else, because these are the unsung heroes of this story. And so I want to do a scene from Transfigurations um, about Esther telling the story from the perspective of a eunuch. And I don't know the affect of a eunuch. I have no idea. But I know that my predominantly, well not predominantly, but I often have gay male audience members. Um, and I decided to create my eunuch a certain way. Uh, and we can have a discussion about that at some point. I have other eunuchs in the play that I present differently. But um, I want to do this scene from Transfigurations. And I want to um, recognize that in a story, sometimes the most important people are the most invisible. Oh, you have come at the perfect time. No, it's been absolutely crazy here in the court of Xerxes. <laughs> the king, Xerxes, that's his Persian name. You probably call him something different. Most people do. Oh, no, it's been absolutely crazy, and of course it was up to the eunuchs to fix everything because that's what we do. Yes, I am a eunuch here in King Xerxes' court. Ironically, they call me He-Guy. <laughs> it's my Persian name. The trouble started about mm, 10 years ago. Xerxes got into his head that he wanted to have this blowout party and invite everyone who was anyone from his entire kingdom, which extends from India to Ethiopia, size queen that he is. <laughs> so of course it was up to the eunuchs to make the magic happen because that's what we do. Oh, they put me in charge of decorations, oh, the banners, the tapestries, the hanging gardens. They're going to talk about this party for a long time. <laughs> the celebration lasted for a full six months because in here in Persia, when we party, we don't play. <laughs> <laughs> it was a huge success. So much so that once we packed everyone up and cleaned the place, Xerxes decided to hold a second celebration to honor all of the officials of the court, from the lowest to the highest. 
And I am, of course, one of the highest. <laughs> this celebration lasted for seven days. And on the seventh and final day of the celebration, Xerxes was with his drinking buddies, drunk off his royal throne, when he summoned me to his side. Yes, mighty, exalted, and highly inebriated Xerxes, <laughs> how may I serve my king? Oh, he wanted me to go into the harem to fetch Vashti. She's gorgeous the queen. He wanted to parade her around in, in front of some of her ma his male guests. Well, I tried to explain to him that Vashti's not into that whole thing, but you cannot talk sense to the king. Mm. So, being a eunuch, as I am, I have pretty much unfettered access into every part of the palace, including the women's quarters. I guess they figure that since I'm technically weaponless, <laughs> that somehow I'm not interested. And we'll let them continue to think that now, won't we? Thank you. So I went right into the harem, went straight to the queen. Oh, Vashti, huge problem with the queen. What's that? Yes, he's been drinking again. Oh, we've got to do that whole intervention thing you've been telling me about. <laughs> now, here's the deal. You are gorgeous. Your skin's looking beautiful. The king wants you to do a little walkthrough. In, out, five minutes, you don't have to say a word. <laughs> She would have none of it. She said, I am no plaything to be dangled in front of these men. I've got a heart, I've got a mind, I've got ideas for this kingdom. I completely agreed with her. Just didn't think it was the best political move to make. <laughs> so I asked her, Vashti, sweetheart, <laughs> darling, is that your final answer? <laughs> mm, that's what I was afraid of. So being the eunuch, I had to be the bearer of bad news, which can prove. Fatal. O oh, mighty, exalted, and unbelievably kind and compassionate Xerxes. <laughs> Little problem with the queen. Um, she's temporarily um, indisposed, and <laughs> he exploded. Rageaholic that he is, crying for her head. It took us three days to calm him down. Sadly, Vashti was stripped of her crown, banished from the palace. Ugh. So for the next few weeks, I was completely consumed with the queen, packing her things, finding her a place to stay. Uh, but don't worry about Vashti. She's going to be fine. She's very resourceful. In fact, I've encouraged her to write a book about her experiences here in the palace. <laughs> so as I was busy with the queen, I began to get troubling reports about the king, how he was lonely, confused, depressed. Without his queen, he didn't know who he was. Uh, please. <laughs> so I got together with some of the other eunuchs and we came up with this amazing idea that we pitched to the king. Oh, mighty, exalted, and really sad and downtrodden looking Xerxes. We, your royal eunuchs, would love to scour your entire large kingdom in search of beautiful young women. We will put these through the paces and when we have some finalists, we will present them to you and you, King Xerxes, will decide who will be Persia's next top queen. <laughs> he loved it. He's all about the spectacle and that's what we did. We went to every backwater place in this kingdom and I nearly despaired. Okay, I saw beautiful women, don't get me wrong, but to be a queen, take somebody special. But then I saw her, beautiful, bright-eyed, flawless complexion, young girl, no more than 16 or 17 by the name of Hadassah. I said, young lady, if you like, there might be a place in the palace for you. She said, yes. I brought her here, changed her name to Esther, more Persian sounding, handpicked her handmaidens, because you've got to be careful around here, and put her on my own personal diet and beauty regime. I prepared her for the big reveal. Now, the thing is, being a eunuch, as I am, the men of the court, well, they don't treat me like one of the boys. <laughs> They often come to me looking for advice or a shoulder to cry on, and they often tell me their secrets, their sexual secrets. I become the repository of everyone's sexual fantasies. I could just be sitting in the garden minding my own business when some judge or general a page comes by and says, hey, guy, you know what I've always wanted to try? To which I always say, mm, I'm good, thanks. <laughs> But they always tell me, and let me tell you, some of these guys, freaks. Oh. <laughs> well, it can come in handy, though, sometimes. One night, King Xerxes himself invited me to spend the evening with him in his private 
bedroom chambers. And somewhere in the middle of the night, as we're knocking back a couple of flasks of wine, King Xerxes turns to me and says, hey, guy, you know what I would love? I would love if a woman just burst in here and blah, 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 blah. He revealed his deepest, darkest, freakiest sexual fantasy. And I thought, I'm going to file this one away. <laughs> this one can come in handy someday. And sure enough, the day came, the day when Esther was summoned to appear before King Xerxes. Shh, no, 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 sweetheart, no. You've got nothing to be worried about. You're gorgeous. You've always been, I admit. My beauty regime has worked wonders. No, but you're going to be fine. But when you go into the king's private bedroom chamber, I want you to bring only what I tell you. Nothing more, nothing less, okay? So bring in this feather, <laughs> this leather strap, <laughs> Oh, yes. Mm. And this op over ripened mango. <laughs> Trust me, it'll all make sense. Okay. <laughs> so you go in there, you have a good time, don't worry about anything. Oh. And that's when I was worried about everything. I mean, I'd be getting closer to the king, and if he selected Esther as his queen, well, it would be good for my career. <laughs> I had nothing to worry about. First thing in the morning, King Xerxes comes bounding out of his chamber, puts his bear paw around me and says, Hey, he guy, that Esther of yours, she just burst in here and blah, 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 blah. However did she know? Hmm. So Esther became Queen Esther, and then, ugh, and then all hell broke loose. Because turns out she's part of some minority population. We're very inclusive here in the kingdom. But somehow, some high official d who didn't like her people passed an edict to utterly destroy them. <laughs> How did these things even get through? So being the eunuch, I had to go to the queen and talk to her. I had to go out of the palace and talk to some cousin or uncle of hers. I went to the king's people. I set up some lunches. We smoothed the whole thing over. Some heads had to roll because that's how they solve problems around here. But the important thing is she is firmly in her place, he is firmly in his place, and I... Well, you see, behind every great monarchy, there is a he guy. <laughs> So, according to Jen Everhart, there are lots of eunuchs in the Bible, and potentially lots more that we're not aware of, because the Hebrew word for eunuch is saris, which also gets translated in English as official. Mm -hmm. So every time you're reading an English version of the Hebrew Bible and you see the word official, there was a discussion among scholars saying, so we're going to say official or eunuch, or a eunuch who's an official. What are we going to do here? Uh, and so there are lots of saris all over the Bible that when you look at it, it could go a different way. So, for instance, um, Joseph was a slave in the household of Potiphar, who was an official of Pharaoh's court, a saris of Pharaoh's court. Um, and it's an interesting thing if we take an interpretation that what if he were a eunuch, which some scholars have suggested. Well, suddenly the story changes a little bit because, you know, of course women always get a bad rap in Bible interpretation, it seems, and Potiphar's wife is presented as this, as this lascivious cougar looking after, you know, looking for some young, hot male flesh who seduces or tries to seduce Joseph. But what if there's a woman married to a eunuch who, her husband's a non-procreative male, she wants to start a family, here's this person who's practically like a family member, a possible sperm donor? surrogate husband, father? You know, it's a different way of looking at that story and humanizes the story a lot more. Um, a lot of people know about the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. That one comes up a lot. A lot of people don't realize there are actually two Ethiopian eunuchs uh, in the Bible. There's the famous one that Christians often talk about in Acts chapter 8. Uh, and then there's another one in Jeremiah chapter 38. Now, Jeremiah was a prophet. I know, you thought he was a bullfrog. <laughs> See, this misinformation gets out there in the mainstream, and that's your job, to correct this. And like a prophet of old, he had a message that was unpopular with the masses. It happens, if you're going to take on the job of a prophet, you're going to piss off a lot of people. The message was this, um, we're going to be invaded, and we're going to lose, and we're going to be taken into exile, and God says, don't fight, just go with it. 
You know, and you know, people don't like to be told that they're losers. And they like to fight. And so the people in power said, screw you, Jeremiah. You know, we don't listen to your message. The king was actually very sympathetic to Jeremiah, but the king didn't have a whole lot of power. Uh, and so he couldn't really do anything. And at one point, the enemies of Jeremiah capture him and drag him back to the palace and, and imprison him. They actually put him in a well or a cistern, and they leave the old man prophet down there to die. Enter ebed Melech. Ebed Melech, the famous Bible character, the hero of the, the story. I, it's my one job, my one goal on, on earth is that when I say Ebed Melech, people will go, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. <laughs> Ebed Melech is an Ethiopian eunuch, a saris in the court, and goes to the king and says, your servant, Jeremiah, he's, he's going to die. We've got to do something. And the king says, you know, my hands are tied. But you know what? Do this. Here are 30 fighting men. See what you can do. And Ebed Melech organizes a special ops midnight raid to Navy SEAL Jeremiah out of the palace. And it's a brilliant campaign. As far as we know, no one gets hurt. It's a rescue. I, I come from a Quaker perspective these days, and it's a great story because Quaker kids are always wanting to play war and fight. And I'm like, just do the Ebed Melech story. It's like, you know, military rescue. And, um, and, and, and Ebed Melech is a wonderful strategist. He, uh, he thinks of everything, including, well, a rope, obviously, to pull up the prophet, and old rags. He takes old rags and he throws them down. He says, put these under your arms so that when we pull you up, you won't injure yourself. And he rescues him. So in this story, we have a character who's presented as a black, African, surgically altered, gender variant savior. This is a story that needs to be told and known. Uh, in Jeremiah 38 and 39, Jeremiah meets up with uh, Ebed Melech again and thanks him and says, you know, well, you know, people aren't listening, so God is going to destroy, you know, these people. They're stiff-necked. But since you showed me this kindness, God is going to spare you and bless you. Not you and your household, which often happens. We hear that blessing because... There's no household there. You have a non-procreative male. But God is going to bless you. Which brings us to, I think, my last story of the night. The other Ethiopian eunuch uh, in the book of Acts. And I want to um, perform this, this scene. Uh, and it's narrated, actually, in Transfigurations by a main character that I haven't been able to present because of how we're doing this. But it's an unnamed disciple of Jesus. Um, we don't know who the disciple of Jesus is at the beginning of the play, and then there's this big reveal at the end. So this disciple of Jesus is telling the story of, of the Ethiopian eunuch, and then sort of it becomes the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. So we're still doing okay? Ready for the final story? Growing up in a religious family, in Jerusalem, we always went to the temple. And I loved the temple with all of the courtyards and the fountains and people from all over the world. Now, when you come to our temple, on the one side, you'll see the men with their long beards and the young men studying scripture, discussing politics, arguing. And on the other side, you see the women and the children discussing scripture, preparing food, arguing. And I remember when I was little at the temple, I would often see Desta. Desta was beautiful and handsome. Desta looked like a woman, but dressed like a man. Very dark, darker than us. Black from Africa. Very rich. A servant of Queen Candace's court. Desta would come to Jerusalem, and being devout would come to our temple and worship. And I don't know why, but I always felt drawn to Desta and wanted to talk to Desta. And one day I said to my friends, why don't we introduce ourselves to Desta? And they said, no, our parents forbid it. That one is unclean. That one is deformed. That one is a eunuch. <coughs> so I never talked to Desta. But year after year, I saw Desta return to our temple, always looking a little older and weary and spending less and less time with us. 
Well, not too long ago, I heard good news that one of the apostles actually met Desta. It was Philip. Uh, he was on the south road going out of Jerusalem when who should come rumbling by on a magnificent chariot but Desta, hunched over, reading from a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And Philip, always being very friendly, shouted up and said, Friend, do you understand what you're reading? Seems these days I understand little, but if you know the scripture, come. Explain it to me. I have been puzzling over this passage of a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. I'm curious, does the prophet speak of himself or of someone else? This story sounds familiar. Like a sheep before the shearers is silent, and like a lamb before the slaughter, so he too opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can speak of descendants? For his life was cut off. Tell me, does the prophet speak of himself or someone else? For this story sounds familiar to me. And Philip began to talk about the time we all spent together and how we tried to let all kinds of people come near who often were left out, women and, and lepers. And Jesus had nice things to say about eunuchs too. And they continued speaking and they continued reading until they came to a passage in Isaiah's prophecy that they never heard before. Perhaps they don't read it in the assembly. But it was a promise from God to eunuchs. But reading it that day on that chariot, it seemed as if it were a promise for Desta. Let us continue our reading then, shall we? Thus saith the Lord, Let not the eunuch say, I am a dried up old tree with no future and no hope. For to those eunuchs who keep my commands and honor my Sabbath, I will give you a memorial better than sons and daughters. I will write your name on the walls of my house, and you will never be cut off. Well then, what is to stop me? from being baptized. Oh, earlier in the journey, Philip explained that when we become disciples, we get baptized. It's a sign that we die to our old lives and we're more free to live as ourselves. Desta has since returned home to Ethiopia and there has shared good news and is surrounded by many brothers and sisters, sons and daughters. Oh, Desta always had lots of money, but now Desta is rich. So, very briefly about that story of the Ethiopian eunuch, I have to say, going to white uh, evangelical churches um, most of my life, when I was told this story, it was always a story about Jesus, which is strange, because Jesus isn't in the story. <laughs> and he's referenced at one point, but he's not in the story. Um, and, and what's really strange about it is there's this other character in the story that never got really talked about. It was always a delivery system for Jesus. Well, there's a person there with a body and a history and an identity. In fact, many identities. Of all the people in the Christian Bible, um, the Ethiopian eunuch has more descriptors of who they are than anybody else other than Jesus. 
We know a lot about this person. The writer of that gospel went out of our way to tell us about these many identities. And what has really, really, um, in all of my Christian churches I, I ever went to, always this story of the Ethiopian eunuch reading this Jewish text is used and, and Jesus is placed over it like this is a prophecy of how Jesus is going to suffer and die. But if you're an actor and you sit for days and days and days like I have done with this eunuch, and you think about the possible experience this person had as a young person being held down against their will and cut and altered forever, unable to live the life that perhaps they wanted to live, maybe have a family, you know, their life was suddenly altered. And they're reading this passage about someone like a sheep before the shearer is silent, like a lamb before the slaughter, so he too opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can speak of his descendants for his life was cut off? Is this person reading a prophecy or looking in a mirror? And, you know, in the work that I do, the biblical work I do, I, I explore the text sometimes through theater and through drama, and I learn stuff I only will learn if I perform it and I sit with it for days and days. Maybe other people can figure it out without doing it, but I, I, it helps me to see it in a fresh new way. And, you know, to me, ultimately, my, the theology I'm interested in is, is the bodies of the people and the stories of the people, and not even just Bible people. At the end of the day, I don't really care that much about the Bible. I care about people today who are alive and the justice issues that we need to look at. And if looking at ancient stories can help open up our imagination, our understanding of looking at people today, particularly for people for whom the Bible is so important, well, that is good work that I'm, I'm happy to do. Um, so we have just a very few minutes. Uh, I'm sorry I went so long. I didn't even cover everything I wanted to do, but um, I would love to hear any questions or, or comments that you have. Or, since I'm a Quaker, we could just sit in silence. It's <laughs> really cool. Uh, I wonder, do you ever feel like sometimes uh, you're trying to redeem an irredeemable text or something. I'm thinking of Jael, and when she drives the tent peg, she's still, she's still stereotyped, or, or she's still cast in this role of the subversive female that still, he asks, get me milk and bread, and she goes and does it and gets it for him. And she's still kind of this caretaker. So do you ever find yourself trying to redeem a text, but there's that tension where where you almost feel like this, we're emphasizing a part of her that, that shows gender transgression or, or she's sort of getting outside of the stereotype but at the same time playing into it as well. And you're always up against that tension, mm -hmm. at least I find. Uh, I'm a PhD student in Hebrew Bible here. So, I, and I really appreciate uh, the academics behind uh, everything you've done there. I think it's just fantastic. Uh, I found myself thinking, God, he knows the Hebrew, he knows this man. He was an awesome scholarship, by the way, uh, informing whatever you're doing. But even in, in readings of Genesis uh, 1 through 3, some scholars just sort of throw it out and just say it's irredeemable. Why even try to hmm. give these voices to a text that just constantly seems to go against what what we perceive to be social justice yeah. that, that we are comfortable with. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I do. And, and you know, there's some... real pessimistic type of question. Sure. I mean, I, we, we had a little chat about this before. I mean, how do you redeem the Sodom, Sodom story? Everyone's behaving, misbe uh, misbehaving in that story. I mean, the only the character that I really... Well, I mean, the one character that I, I really admire is Lot's wife. I mean, of all of them, as presented in what they do, she's the most moral character because she doesn't turn her back on that violence. And so I think sometimes there are texts that can't be redeemed. And for those of us who come from a Bible background, that's terrifying because there's all this like superstition and fear around that. And it's also there's a grieving process because we were told to trust this book. It's also very liberating to say, you know, this story can't be redeemed. This is, this, is a bad, this is a bad story. There are bad things that happen to people in this story. Um, I also look at the text very much like an actor, get, just given a script, and I go non-judgmentally at times. I think it's important to judge text. I, this is essential. But with the work that I do, it's also important for me to just tell the story as it is, with all of its horror and wonder and bizarreness, beauty, and just tell the story and let, the, let people then 
for themselves make decisions about the text. That part of my idea is to demonstrate that and, and, and not always to make the critique for them. Yes? You talked about speaking and uh, feeling called to speak in evangelical circles and speaking in some more conservative groups. Now I'm wondering what sort of responses you've had. Um, well, sometimes when I speak with evangelical pastors, it's a very closed door meeting where you know, we agree. I'm not going to ever say I met with this person on this day. Um, but even here in Middle Tennessee, I've had closed door meetings with Southern Baptist senior pastors of Southern Baptist churches. And I always start by telling my testimony. I'm telling my story and how much I, you know, I became born again and I loved Jesus and I wanted to serve Jesus with all my life and with all my heart and everything. And that's why I try to repent with all my heart of homosexuality. And I go through the process and I show them that anything that they would counsel me, I've done sincerely and earnestly. And I show them the consequences of it and the damage and the harm and the, you know, the depression and the confusion that it brought to the point where they will say, well, gosh, in your fight against sin, you've done more than I've ever done with anything. They were actually convicted by that. And we talk then about these Bible stories um, and talk about it from a pastoral care point of view. I have never had any negative pushback. I've had people get very excited about these stories. I've had them even make their own leaps and conclusions. Like I, when I tell the story of the Ethiopian eunuch, I'm not talking about gay people. I'm not even talking about trans people. I'm just talking about how this person is presented in the text. And I had a pastor say, wow, I wonder what that means then for gays and lesbians. I'm like, that's a good question for you to mull over. I hadn't thought of that. Uh, and what my experience is um, there are people painted in the corner who are desperate to find a way out. Uh, and this oppression is exhausting. And they need on-ramps and off-ramps, and partly they need new stories that are right there. And, and the, the thing that I've often been told by evangelicals, they appreciate how much I respect the text and stick close to the text. So I told stories that maybe some of you have never heard before or haven't read in years, but you'll find that point by point, I'm sticking very close to the story. Even the Esther story, with all the wildness going on, the only thing I really added and embellished was the mango. <laughs> I mean, because even the eunuch says, take only what I tell you. It doesn't reveal what that is, but the, the eunuch had some insider information, which when I interviewed a trans man who talked about being in this middle ground of gender when people couldn't identify him as male or female, he said at his job, everyone just started asking him questions about sex, and it was like, what the hell is going on here? And he suddenly seemed like this safe person to talk to about sex and, and stuff. And, uh, and he said, and then I thought about the eunuch, and you know, in that story, is it possible the eunuch's privy to information of what the king likes because of being a eunuch? Because clearly says, it clearly knows something, says, take only what I tell you. Wish I knew. <laughs> and and so, so I really stick close to the text, and they appreciate that um, because I actually use very traditional evangelical tools in how I talk about these texts that I'm sure lots of queer theorists are kind of cringing at when I do. But you know what? It's not ultimately for y'all. Um, yeah, no, be, because I want them... I don't want them to fault me on how I talk about the text. Um, and in a way, that helps them because they say, well, we can't fault him. You know, I don't like the Ketone et Passim business, but it is there. And they'll never read Joseph the same way again, ever. We have time for maybe one more quick question. Encore. Encore. Encore? <laughs> Well, I can tell one more story from the Christian Bible, if you like. Wow. All right. All right. So this is an example of where it's scholarship um, mixed with art, mixed with the text, uh, to create a midrash, basically, to, to flesh out a story. And I think the Christian tradition needs to learn something very important from the, the Jewish tradition and that is the rabbinical tradition. I mean, the, the rabbinical tradition has all these rabbis saying, well, rabbi so-and-so says it's this, rabbi so-and-so says it's that, and they kind of disagree and they fight. And they, while the Christian tradition, it's almost like, this is what the church says. This is, uh, reproduce this teaching over and over, the same teaching, don't deviate. And that is problematic, because then we have a hard time, those of us who come from churches, thinking in new, fresh ways. So, in my, um, 
interviews, I interviewed uh, many people, and this one trans woman, I basically have taken some of her story and wove it in with this very famous moment from the gospel. And again, it will be narrated by this um, unnamed, unknown uh, disciple of Jesus. I once met someone who didn't quite fit. It was about the time of the Passover, and Jesus didn't tell us where we would spend the Passover celebration. He often kept plans to the last minute. We even began to get word from our family saying that we could spend the, the celebration with them. They added, you could even bring your friends. <laughs> and it was the day before the Passover, and Simon Peter persuaded me to ask Jesus, Rabbi, where will we have our Passover? And Jesus said, perfect, I want you and Thomas and Philip to go into the city. There you will find a man carrying a pitcher of water. Follow that one home and say to the master of the house that we have need of a place. There you will find an upper room fully furnished. Go, make preparations there. Well, Simon Peter exploded. He said, Jesus, this is outrageous. There are no empty rooms. We needed to make our plans weeks, months ago. <laughs> and besides, you're sending them on a fool's errand to find a man carrying a pitcher of water? Everybody knows only women and children carry water. They're going to be walking around the city for days. But Jesus said, go. You will find it just as I tell you. So Thomas, Philip, and me, we got up and we went down towards the well. And sure enough, there in the distance, we saw one that looked like a man carrying a pitcher of water. Well, the story behind this one, earlier that same day, Levi had gathered all of his family there at his father's house, his, his parents, his grandparents, his aunts and uncles, cousins, brothers and sisters, and all their small children. And once they were settled, he turned to them and said, Dear ones, we are about to begin our Passover celebrations, our deliverance from bondage. And I have to confess that um, for much of my life, I have felt as if I were a slave. N not that you treated me badly, it's just that, well, you remember when I was little, I liked to play with my sisters and my girl cousins. And you said, oh, it's just a phase. He'll grow out of it. But I never did. I just grew secretive. And through the years, I realized that there must be something wrong with me, that somehow the outside of me doesn't match the inside. I mean, inside, I always knew I was a little girl growing up into a woman, but outside, you've only ever known me as Levi. So I've turned to God, and I called upon the name of the Lord, God who desires truth in the inmost part. And God has given me peace. So as we begin our Passover celebration, I choose to live my life outwardly as, as it's always been inwardly, as female. And from now on, I would like you all to please call me Miriam. It was as if a demon had materialized in front of them. Uh, there was yelling and screaming, renting of garments and mourning, mothers dragging the children out of the house, while the father raged around the room saying, look what you are doing to your mother. You're ruining Passover. But Miriam stood still in the midst of the chaos. And then she saw it, the empty pitcher. She reached for it. Her father grabbed her hand. Young man, what do you think you're doing? Father, I, um, I, I, I don't mind. I, I mean, I, I feel as if I'm a woman. I don't mind doing women's work. Young man, please, don't do this. If you leave this house with, with that picture, no good will do. No good will come of it. Father, you know I have always honored you and mother. Come good or evil, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I must obey God. And for the first time since she was little, Miriam picked up the pitcher and walked outside of the house. The neighbors looked on in shock, shock and horror that somebody from such a good family would be doing something so outrageous. She came to the well and the women there saw her, laughed and moved aside. And there in that ancient well, she took her clay jar and she plunged it into the cool, cool waters and placed it onto her strong, 
strong shoulders and turned to go home. And it was at that moment we saw one in the distance that looked like a man carrying a pitcher of water. We ran up to the, that one and said, it's just like the teacher told us. And Thomas asked, so is it true that you have an empty room where we can have our Passover? Yeah, thanks to me, I think all the rooms are now empty. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. So, sadly, I leave very early in the morning, so if you want to hang out and talk or ask other questions, I can hang out here and we can just do all of that. I want to particularly thank Rebecca and Sharon for making this happen. Ellen, it's so wonderful to see you again. Aaron for running around and doing everything. Uh, and it's just really been an honor just to be with you. I'm so excited and I have so much hope uh, for the future with this fine work that you're doing. And thank you for letting me be a part of it. So, thanks. Bible scholar with a good foundation and mascara. <laughs> and uh, this one, um, reading the Bible as a, as a woman, I always use protection. <laughs> with a bunch of them. The Lord is my shepherd, which technically makes me a furry. <laughs> Just true. You may like this one. Mary's mother warned her about leaving the window open at night. <laughs> Let it soak in. Think about it. It'll hit you later. Uh, Jesus ate with the sinners, even the heterosexuals. <laughs> and finally, Jesus loves you, but not in a gay way. <laughs> so check me out on Twitter. All right, enough of the clapping. <laughs>